since I usually start episodes by asking guests to give brief practical recommendations, I'm going to do the same here. And I do this because of what's called the serial position effect, which is a psychological phenomenon in which people tend to remember things that come at the start and end of events, respectively, so-called primacy and recency effects. So I'm going to provide some basic advice that's going to work well for most people. And some of my recommendations are based on data from rigorous experiments, but some are just best guesses based on me trying to be reasonable. Starting with sleep, try and maintain a relatively fixed wake time each day. That should happen naturally if you're doing the other things that I'll discuss, but a lot of people sleep in on the weekends and ideally restrict this to no more than one hour of additional sleep on the weekends. Maybe allow two if you're very short on sleep. And I would recommend up to two if, for example, you have teenagers who have to wake at a time that is very early for their biological clocks before going to school. Don't fixate on when you go to bed as much. Instead, you should only ever go to bed when you're actually sleepy. But again, that time of day should be quite regular if you're following my other tips. Regarding your light exposure, spend at least an hour outdoors in daylight each day. More is often better than that, but obviously you should never get burned. When you're indoors, sit by windows when you can, because the intensity of light that you're exposed to falls exponentially the further you get away from windows. Otherwise, use bright overhead lighting indoors. Think of trying to mimic sunlight. If you're trying to shift your clock earlier, so for example, if you regularly wake to an alarm clock and that curtails your sleep, then aim to get at least 30 minutes outdoors in daylight within two hours of waking. Whereas if you're trying to shift your clock later, and this is often true of older adults, you should aim to get at least 30 minutes outdoors in daylight between about three hours before your target bedtime and one hour before your target bedtime. So if your target bedtime was 10 p.m., then that would be between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. And if you're trying to shift your clock and therefore your sleep, be physically active at those times of day when you're getting daylight, because that might have some additive effects on the timing of your clock. If you're not trying to shift your clock timing, or if you're trying to shift earlier, definitely reduce your exposure to light in the three hours before bed. And you want low amber lights at this time. Think of trying to mimic firelight in your indoor environment. So some ways that you could do this would be to use dimmers if you have them. Otherwise, rely on lamps instead of overhead lights. And then during the sleep period, minimize the amount of light that reaches your eyes. And for a lot of people, that would just mean closing the curtains. But for some people, that might mean using blackout blinds if they live in a very brightly lit neighborhood and or using an eye mask. Regarding your physical activity, ideally avoid very strenuous activity in the one hour after waking and the three hours before bed. And if you have to exercise early, let's say that it's within three hours of waking, use a longer warm up at that time of day because your core body temperature is lower. That will help your performance. The optimal time for performance in most activities is in the late biological afternoon, probably five to six hours before bed. And that coincides with the end of the working day for most people, which is quite convenient. And then otherwise just sprinkle low to moderate intensity activity throughout the rest of your waking day. A lot of people now are interested in things like cold water immersion and sauna use. So I want to give some guidance regarding thermal stress as well. With respect to cold, it's not for everyone. I think a lot of people assume that it is nowadays because it's become so popular in recent years. But the narratives put forward by many people discussing this subject tend to be very imbalanced and disregard some real risks of cold water immersion in particular. 
and I'll come back to those in a later podcast. But for now, I'll just say that while there's very little research on what the best time of day is for this type of exposure, if you try it, I would avoid doing this within three hours of waking in the morning, if possible, and probably also avoid it in the three hours before you go to bed at night. And the ideal time might well be in the early afternoon because that way you get a boost in your alertness, but it's also not so close to bed that it could detrimentally affect your sleep. Regarding heat exposure, I'm personally more bullish about the upsides of sauna use than cold water immersion, but I would still probably avoid it in the one hour after waking in the morning and the four hours before bed. Theoretically, it could probably be used slightly later than that. The issue is that you need time to rehydrate following high sweat rates while in the sauna. Regarding your nutrition, with respect to your calorie intake, it's really important to maintain a regular eating window each day, which is the time that elapses between when you first consume something that contains a substantial number of calories. Let's just say that's 50 calories. And when you finish your last item each day that contains that number of calories. The sweet spot for most people, I believe, is an eating window of about eight to 10 hours, but it can be as short as six hours, particularly if you're trying to lose body fat or if you're on a ketogenic diet and you're trying to accelerate entry into ketosis, or it could be as long as 12 hours, especially if you struggle to maintain your weight or if you're trying to gain weight while still being healthy. Regarding the timing of this window, earlier is generally better, but I'd still wait at least an hour after waking before opening the window. And I'd also definitely look to close at least two hours before bed. Outside of this window, very low calorie items are fine. So things like black tea, green tea, black coffee, sugar-free beverages. But if you're a coffee or tea drinker, for example, you should not add milk to those items outside of this window. Next, regarding your carbohydrate and fat intake, I would definitely look to front load your intake within the window in general. The old adage of eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince and dinner like a pauper actually makes a lot of sense for a lot of people. But you should factor in when you're physically active. So if you follow my previous recommendation to exercise in the afternoon, then I think it's fine to distribute much of your carbohydrate and or fat intake around the exercise. And this is probably more important for carbohydrate than it is for fat intake. But frankly, we need to better understand that subject because there just hasn't been that much research on it just yet. Protein intake is a bit different. And if you look at how most people distribute their protein intake in countries such as the UK and the US, they tend to have lots of their intake each day at dinner, a modest amount at lunch, and then very little at breakfast. And actually, it's better to evenly spread your intake each day across those meals. And I'll come back to why that's the case, but in short, it's to help with things like appetite regulation and knitting together new muscle tissue. So for a lot of people, it makes sense to add some protein in particular to their breakfast and maybe a small amount to lunch too. There are some specific constituents in foods and drinks that can affect your body's clock as well. And one of these is caffeine. Again, I'll return to the biology of this later, but for most people, and I'll add that there's huge variation between individuals. Capping caffeine intake at no more than about three milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight per day is a good place to start. There are resources out there like Caffeine Informer where you can get information about caffeine contents of commonly consumed foods and drinks. To give you an idea, 100 grams of 70% cocoa dark chocolate typically contains about 80 milligrams of caffeine. An eight ounce instant coffee contains about 50 milligrams, as does a cup of tea of the same size. 
a shot of espresso contains about 70 milligrams. So a store-bought Americano, which is made with two shots, contains about 140 milligrams. An eight ounce French press contains about 110 milligrams. Eight ounce Aero press contains probably more like 150 or so. Hopefully that gives you an idea of the quantities and commonly consumed items, but you might want to look further into this subject if it's something never really thought about previously. And certainly finish consuming your final caffeinated item of the day at least nine hours before bed. After this time, decaf alternatives are absolutely fine. Another of these constituents is alcohol, and it can both disrupt your sleep, but also disrupt your body's clock in many different ways. And I don't want to be a killjoy. I myself like a drink from time to time. And instead, I'll just say, aim to cap your intake at no more than 14 units per week, as per government guidelines in most countries, with no more than four on a given day. And this might sound a little bit difficult to pass, but I'd recommend allowing at least one hour before bed per unit consumed plus one hour. So to give you an example, a pint of beer is typically about two units. So two units would be two hours, but then plus one hour, that would be finishing a pint of beer at least three hours before bed. If it was two pints of beer, that would be four units plus one hour. So that'd be finishing your two pints of beer at least five hours before bed. And that's to do with the rate at which your body can detoxify alcohol. And then that brings us to fluid in general. And there's not much evidence that things like water intake will affect the circadian clock, your biological clocks. But nevertheless, I think it is relevant to sleep and you should modify your patterns of fluid intake according to your sleep. Because obviously you don't want to continuously wake up during the night needing to pee. And in general, I think coinciding your final drink of the day with your final calories of the day is a good starting point, but you might even want to cap your intake earlier than that. And then regarding medications, there are best times of day at which to take certain medications. For example, it seems to be best to take ACE inhibitors, which are commonly used to reduce blood pressure in the evening. And that's to counter the morning rise in blood pressure that we experience each day. Another example is there are various different arthritis drugs that are best taken around bedtime, including some glucocorticoids. And that's in part because of the daily patterns of symptoms that people experience. So ask your doctor if there's a best time of day at which to take the medications that you've been prescribed. Okay, that was a huge list of recommendations. And so now you can tune out and go about your day. But being serious, we'll explore the rationale behind each of those recommendations in depth in due course. But at this point, you might still be wondering what these clocks that I'm banging on about are and their associated rhythms. And so let's now turn our attention to these.